Could everyone please mute while our three speakers uh, hold forth. Uh, I will speak very briefly just to welcome you to about the 15th of these. I'll say now and say at the end, I hope to see many of you in Williamstown on June 9th to 12th and uh, hasten to register. It's the best deal around. Uh, now that we are Greylocks, no longer called the old guard, which is a good thing. Um, uh, housing is a little tight, but uh, it's, it's worth coming. Uh, please, please, please consider it. Uh, without further ado, then, I will introduce Harry Schooley, Harry Matthews, and Tom Eric in that order, and that's the order in which they will speak to share with us their reflections, experiences at the Williams record as it was in the uh, late 1960s, mid 1960s while we were in college. And you'll uh, no longer exist in its present form, but I'll leave that to them. And at the moment, I will ask Harry Schooley, who's going to begin this on a light, but rather, uh, I think, incisive note with his wonderful cartoons, which he has archived all these years, and will now show us. Harry, please begin. Very good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you and to share with you my, uh, my cartoons from the, uh, our years at, at Williams. I'm going to share a screen now and hope that that will happen. Okay. There we are. Well done. Very good. Okay. Uh, my experience with the record was peripheral at best. All my cartoons were done over our freshman through junior years, and I had no specific assignments. I would do a cartoon, show it around a bit, and then take it over to the records office in Baxter and turn it in. The editors would then determine if it would be printed or rejected, and several were rejected. But I saved only one of them, and we'll see of the rejected ones, and we'll see that here in a few minutes. I also did an occasional cartoon illustration for MISC. If you remember MISC, it was a satire magazine. Uh, but tonight, these are all from the record. There is absolutely no political correctness and sometimes blatant undocumented borrowing from other sources. And some of these cartoons would never be acceptable today. My signature for all my cartoons was a little duck. Uh, and you see that little duck there in front of you. Uh, he appears somewhere, or she, I assume it's a he, appears somewhere in the picture. And in most, the duck wears a shirt with a dollar sign on it, uh, the dollar sign representing my initials H and S, uh, one on top of the other. Now, once folks were aware of the duck, that became sort of what they looked for first. Uh, sometimes I'm sure once the duck was found, there was no need to contemplate the cartoon any further. Uh, sort of reminiscent of Al Hirschfeld's Nina in the New York Times on Sundays, if you remember looking for Nina, or Pat Oliphant's Little Penguin uh, in his cartoon, which were in numerous papers, but I remember them kind of from the Denver Post. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look here. Uh, this was my first cartoon. It ran in the spring of 1964. So this was our freshman year. And it relates to a student referendum on proposed changes to the school student government. Um, and I do this with apologies to Lewis Carroll's illustrator, uh, John Tenniel. Um, I basically had no understanding of what the issues were between one government and a new one. Um, but apparently there was such a thing, and uh, the editorial staff liked this cartoon, and they ran it. Uh, and it's certainly you can see it's blatantly stolen, and there's a little duck uh, up in the tree. Uh, the New Williams raised all sorts of questions about the nature of the college in the future, and I, I hope uh, either Harry or Tom will address this further. 
Uh, in my cartoon, the wizards are President Sawyer and Dean Benjamin Labery. And uh, I've set this in the Wizard of Oz context, obviously, the college council, the fraternities, the hours, <laughs> Dorothy representing the hours, and social units, um, the cowardly lion, as we not, did not really know where we were going with that. Uh, there was a rumor that Dean Labory would be abolishing the college council's privilege of determining the time limits for female visitors to student rooms. And this cartoon I originally intended to be titled No More My Fair Lady. Uh, and the rumor proved untrue, but the editorial board liked the cartoon, so they ran it anyway. And you can see that uh, it is uh, borrowed uh, from the Columbia record album of 1955 of uh, My Fair Lady. And uh, so we see uh, Dean Labory uh, possibly cutting the strings between the College Council on Hours and Hours, and My Little Duck floating by on a balloon. Uh, this cartoon comments on the college's new policy of randomly assigning incoming freshmen to the new social units. Um, Donald Gardner was an assistant dean, and senior Howard Peterson was the head of the Student Choice Committee. So I set this in the settings of a McDonald's or Burger King or whatever hamburger places were there at that time. Uh, and uh, the class of 68 being randomly assigned for the, uh, uh, the future in terms of their residence. Freshman Parents Day. What actually is and what freshman parents see? Okay. That ring a bell? <laughs> uh, we predicted LBJ would win over Goldwater in the 1964 election. They asked me to draw a map showing where what states would go with whom. Uh, the duck is sh showing us that Alaska, DC, and Hawaii would go for Johnson. Uh, how did we fare here? Well, uh, we were only off by about 60, uh, 60 votes, uh, electoral votes uh, for both candidates. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was, uh, that was the election. I understand, I think it was uh, either Tom or Harry who, who reminded me that with the uh, student election, um, or who, as for who would, uh, who was running for president, that uh, Donald Duck won as a write-in. I had forgotten that. It's January 1965, and the ever studious Williams man thinks back over the year that has just passed. And uh, in that year, in this cartoon, and we see it in, in sort of details here. Uh, Johnson beat Goldwater, the Beatles changed rock and roll, Harold Wilson became the British Prime Minister, the province of Katanga rebelled against the Congo. Oh my God, that's a terrible way to do that. Uh, Khrushchev was ousted. De Gaulle took France out of the NATO military alliance. It still remained in NATO, but it was no longer participating in militarily. And China tested a nuclear bomb. Uh, the Olympics were in Tokyo. That is also not politically correct, that uh, by any means. And an earthquake shook Alaska and floods ravaged Oregon. But all that paled as Amherst beat Williams, a disappointing finish to an otherwise undefeated season. The theme for the 1965 Winter Carnival uh, was a Viking feast. And this, uh, this cartoon has no caption. It, it's self-explanatory. Uh, it's, I think it's my favorite of all the ones uh, that uh, I did. Uh, with apologies to Delacroix indeed, uh, the uh, new Williams takes its revolutionary surge forward into the future. The new freshman classes will be randomly assigned to their social units. Uh, and this same cartoon could probably have been used when Williams announced it was going co-ed uh, with Liberty more suitably dressed, of course. 
that's what it's based on. And indeed, <laughs> the war in Vietnam was always part of our consciousness. And at this point, my, my leanings were more on the right coming out of a strong Republican background and at home. Uh, and uh, I wasn't quite sure whether or not we should be there or not, but I figured since we were there, uh, nobody should dare challenge the, our, shall we say, a position on, on sending troops over there. And so we see these two soldiers at, at camp under go, 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 go uh, looking at the news from home being all protests and uh, objections to the war. And they're speculating on their future. Who should they be more scared of, the Viet Cong or maybe us? Uh, in light of all of what was developing there in the SDS, um, President Paul Potter visited campus. I did this cartoon uh, in anticipation of a possible conflict of interest between those wanting uh, uh, us out of the war and those who took an opposing stand. Um, and uh, some of you will recognize the two figures on the right as Tim Lull and Steve Block. And Tim Lull and Steve Block were my junior advisors my freshman year. And I ran this cartoon by both of them before I took it into the, uh, the uh, uh, record. Uh, and uh, they approved of the sketch. In the spring of 65, the new Greylock uh, complex was under construction and there was a strike by the hod carriers. Uh, and so the hod carriers uh, wanted $3.50 an hour for, uh, for wages. Wow, uh, have times changed. Uh, and uh, even with all the fuss over Selma and Vietnam, I'll bet you our demands are met first. And they certainly were. Uh, sophomore editorial associates, I'm just throwing this in here to show you that uh, there were a whole mess of sophomores who had a long lasting legacy at, uh, at the record. Uh, I don't wanna quickly read the names, but uh, in the recording of this, if you wanna go back and see it, you can of course stop it and look at that but a lot of us as sophomores uh, were involved with the record. And Harry and Tom, uh, of course, uh, major, major players. Spring. Uh, so in spite the issue of hot carrier wages, spring came early to the Happy Purple Valley. And as you know, we had to get out and catch some rays. So it's that time of year again, where we're gonna go out there and enjoy the sun. Uh, and um, not sure where we where we went. Uh, I understand the kids today all gather on the steps uh, of Chapin, uh, Chapin Beach, as they call it. Maybe we did too. April '65, William students, a lot of them went off to Washington to participate in a demonstration against the war. So I took a satirical look at those who stayed behind on campus. So even with SES in Washington, we have enough groups left for a swell Easter parade. You know, and I look at this now and I go, oh my God, uh, this is what we're doing now uh, in terms of our political, uh, let's say enthusiasm, if that's a proper word for it. So there they are. And sometimes students became a little rowdy, most likely too much Frisbee enthusiasm. And uh, in, this, uh, in this cartoon, we have a rebunctious student who has been sort of uh, corralled by the college cops. And the picture hanging in the back there I, is of Dean Labrie and I labeled it Der Führer. Uh, <laughs> But the uh, editorial staff thought, no, 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 no. We'll just etch that out of there. And so they did. And I don't understand why I was going after the Dean. He was a great teacher in the American History Survey course. And I enjoyed him tremendously as, as a teacher. 
And each May, the college, remember, honored its most scholarly students. Some of them are probably watching this right now by selecting them to gargoyle. Uh, but then there were those who were more worthy of other li more liquid accomplishment. Uh, and for them, there was Gurgle. And uh, the labels, I tried to, to uh, expand the, uh, the, the scope of uh, alcoholic consumption with blimp fuel and motor oil and Mr. Clean and Right Guard and all kinds of other stuff like hash hair and scalp treatment. We finish another year. It's over. Our sophomore year is over. We're about to go into our junior year. We pack up to go home. And then we come back. Uh, the edit editors gave this, this, this caption, Schooly Strikes Back. I'm not striking back at anything in this cartoon. I just have a nice cartoon of a group of, uh, of young men from each class, it's sort of like the E flats. They're singing box sleepers awake. Uh, I don't even know if sleepers awake has words, uh, but there we are back again. And this was the one that was rejected. And you might remember that at Greylock, those buildings had these huge panes of imported glass. Uh, supposedly from Belgium. And in the record, uh, the story said the student confessed to the college authorities for having broken one of the windows uh, in the dining hall. And he was apparently drunk at the time. And these windows imported from Belgium at the cost of $2,600 each. Can you imagine? $2,600 each? Uh, and the crane that was used to install them had to be brought back from Boston uh, to set the replacement paint. And the student's name and punishment were not reported. His confession was hailed as an act of bravery, but certainly there must have been some witnesses. Uh, one wonders whether or not that person is in this you know, group tonight, uh, <laughs> or who knows who he is. Um, can you find the duck? Here's the duck. Yes. All right. Okay. A Thanksgiving cartoon taking its cue from all the civil rights, anti-war and other demonstrations that so dominated our social climate at the time. So I use this every year for Thanksgiving on my Facebook page. It's just as relevant today as it was back then. And this one in December of 65, Pipe Dreams. Uh, it expresses sympathy, sort of, for those professors who assigned research papers due by the start of the winter holidays. Um, and I found this clipping in a letter I had sent my wife. We saved all of our letters from back then and, um, and happily can reproduce it here. When the spirit of Christmas is more of a haunting specter. And there's the little duck, Santa. We're almost at the end. I don't know when this one ran, but there was a flap over a scheme to develop Mount Greylock as a commercial tourist center. And uh, uh, we, of course, were outraged by that, as we all should have been. Uh, and in 1966, the Mount Greylock Protective Association led a campaign that transferred the ultimate responsibility for management and operation of the mountain from Berkshire County to the state park system. And this is our last cartoon. It's January, 1966. And again, our ever studious Williams man thinks back over the year gone by. Uh, so uh, what do we have going on here? Uh, 1965 saw the United States facing such issues as the war in Vietnam, military intervention in the Dominican Republic, rioting in the Watts District of Los Angeles, and increasing popular dissent. Britain took no action to prevent Ian Smith from proclaiming Rhodesia's independence under a white minority government. President Johnson's social program saw the inauguration of Medicare, and the nation saw LBJ's appendicitis scar. And the Northeast experienced a massive power shortage, and we all remember that, of course. Um, we all ran from our various residences, dorms, and so forth, up to Fort Husack House, to the, uh, the Rathskeller, uh, to 
pour ourselves some beer. And since the lights were out, nobody could see the sign up sheet. All right. And the Northeast and it did in the West suffered from drought. But worst of all, Amherst beat Williams again. A 6 2 season. Gentlemen, that finishes my, my role in our discussion, unless later on somebody wants to ask me something. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful, Harry. Really wonderful. Thank you so much, Harry. You set up, keyed up the issues of the time in both a historically significant walk down memory lane and with some hilarity. Thank you very, very much. My so we will, we will now move to the, uh, perhaps one of the most reticent people in our class, but we've asked him to put aside that reticence tonight, the wonderful Harry Matthews, who will reminisce on his editorial or experiences as editor. And then we'll go to Tom, who will bring it all together. And as we look behind and look ahead. So Harry, please proceed. And by the way, at the end, we will have sort of an open panel discussion. Uh, they will be eager to have your questions. And uh, so button your lips for the moment, but uh, keep them in, your, in our aging minds so that we have the <laughs> to hear them. Please proceed, Harry Matthews. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, I'm, I want to get back to a couple of the issues that Harry so charmingly raised, but I'm going to begin by giving you a bit of the mechanics, which I understand many people never understood about the paper. And the first fact is that the record, like most student, most undergraduate <laughs> newspapers around the country, were officially run as independent organizations. Um, uh, financially independent in particular. Now this worked fine in the era of the 40s and the 50s when college newspapers were full of ads for cigarettes and beer. Now of course as we get into the 60s there are a variety of social political and economic pressures which are brought to bear that tended to discourage tobacco companies and brewers from buying space in college newspapers. So revenues plunged all across the country. This was particularly severe at Williams because it happened to coincide with the arrival of the Angeline Court and a lot of campus-wide debate about how the social system should be we organized. Um, um, so we found ourselves particularly for one year, the editor in chief was um, um, John Kiffner, who would later go on to a very distinguished career at the New York Times. Um, uh, but John was determined to cover these important issues fully, whether there was money or not. So while his predecessors had ran up small deficits, he ran up a very large deficit. The college stepped in. It was all out to the printer. The college paid off the printer's bill and made it a loan to the newspaper, which we were supposed to pay back as much as we could every year. I believe it was, yes, it was close to six figures. I think we paid back maybe $1,000. Um, the theory is if we could meet expenses and make a small contribution the college was happy. I mean, the college still gave us free office space and a phone line, no long distance, but at least a phone line. Um, we had our a private phone line for long distance, but the setting was distinctly uh, Spartan, shall we say. Um, uh, two thirds of the typewriters you saw in the record office did not work. <laughs> Many of our reporters would bring their own typewriters in. But in any event, 
as Terry mentioned, there were a large number of people in our class who were involved in the paper in one way or another. So when our predecessors decided who should take over the paper next, they divided things up. At the time, it appeared twice a week, Tuesday and Friday. So the staff was sort of split between Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, Dave Saylor and I were in charge of one weekly edition, and Tom, Eric, and um, um, Doug, I might keep forgetting his last name, but yes, <laughs> yes. There was a completely set, largely separate staff for the other day of the week. Um, now we'd assign the stories about a week in advance, then they'd come in, and two days before the paper published, we would spend a night in the record office, with whoever was in charge would spend a night in the record office, putting the paper together, packing things up. Uh, one of the workers at the printing plant lived in Williamstown, so she would come by the first thing the next morning, take it over to the office and get set and type and laid out. And then in the afternoon, one of us, in, in my case, it was me, would go over to North Adams. Um, uh, <clears throat> I financed this travel by my own thumb. I'm pleased to say the drivers on the drivers on Route Two are very generous toward college students. So I would go over there and fix all the problem last minute problems that arose at the printers, and then it was distributed uh, for every classroom. Each of the houses would pay us for bulk subscriptions. Usually, I think it was 25, 30 copies which would be dropped on a table in the middle of the lounge on the day it was published. I honestly do not remember how we got the paper to freshmen. <laughs> there were some number of mail subscriptions. Also, the college did pay us to send subscriptions to various college offices. So that's, and the small amount of ads we had were what we had to live on. Now, what we wrote about <laughs> depended, well, there were some highly predictable stories, you know, it'd be a story every year about the new entry class. There'd be a story about gargoyles. That was always a special issue. There was a story about um, faculty promotions, which would be announced twice a year. And then we had um, famous visitors, and certainly back in the 60s, as, as Harry pointed out, there were a number of controversial figures on the right and the left who appeared and attracted quite a bit of attention, some polite and some not so polite, as Harry's cartoon mm -hmm. accurately showed. I remember, for example, um, uh, and this went very well, you know, a, a very young um, um, Julian Bond came to the campus and I somehow wound up um, uh, at having lunch with him and several other students. Um, and that was quite intriguing. At the time, he was unknown. And it was kind of fun that as he gained more power and more prestige in the sphere of politics, um, uh, to say, oh, I knew him when <laughs> he was a young activist who did know how to get things done. There was also some discussion about the changes in the social structure at the college. Now, I will freely admit that I came to Williams because I was attracted by the idea of it being a place where they were experimenting with this new social structure. You know, Here we are off in a brave new world, looking for a way to live together without the stuffy and rather restrictive notions that we had had in the past. 
Um, uh, however, I was a bit disappointed. I mean, most of the heavy discussions had gone on before we arrived. By the time we got there, you know, the main lingering debates were um, uh, the um, uh, TDX house, say the Delta Chi was haggling over what the college should do with it. They wound up selling it to the college on the condition it not be used for student housing. It is now used as the alumni and fundraising center. And then there was the old um, sorry, Epsilon House. They refused to sell to the college and in fact sold to the town and it is now the Williamstown Town Hall oh, on North Street. So we covered those stories. And then we found other things. I was particularly interested in um, uh, performing arts. So my issue of the paper would often have a feature story about you know, some company coming to visit the college, some production in the works at the AMT or what have you. I know Tom was particularly interested in the, in the politics. So that was vividly covered in his editions of the paper. He tended to use a bit more pictures than I did too. But I was always very frugal. <laughs> Pictures cost money. Um, now, also, Harry mentioned the fact that there was this new student government organization, which I do happen to remember because somehow this this the student government was supposed to be given more powers that. There was a different system for selecting the members of the council. And there were various committees that were supposed to look after various things. And so I ran and got elected and volunteered for the cultural committee. And there were only a couple of people on the cultural committee and they really had no idea what they wanted to do. And I wanted a film series, so I took the modest budget <laughs> and organized a 14-week film series each semester for two years. I blew half the budget one year on um, A Hard Day's Night, which packed Jessup Hole three times. This is my triumph. I made the budget stretch by paying $12.50 each for a lot of vintage films um, uh, from the 30s and the 40s, which I still like very much, you know. The Thin Man movies, um, uh, it happened one night. I did some avant-garde movies. <sighs> Kenneth Anger's Scorpio Rising, which no one came to see. <laughs> I did also get um, uh, Andy Warhol's Sleep, which if you don't remember, it was eight uh -huh. hours long, simply showing a largely naked Joe D'Alessandro on bed sleeping. I remember the screening particularly because after an hour, my friend Willard Spiegerman uh -huh. rose and announced in a loud voice, if anything happens, come get me <laughs> and left. <laughs> uh, such were the words, such were the ways of the cultural committee. I don't remember any particular issues that arose on the paper. So, um, uh, Occasionally, I would have to take some of the younger reporters aside and explain that you do not bury the lead. <laughs> this is the lead sentence. You put that right up on top so that people know what it is you're writing about. And so that when I get over to the printing company and we have type spilling out the bottom of the tray that we can't print, 
it will be very easy to take out the last two paragraphs of your story and no one will know it except you and I'm terribly sorry, but <laughs> type is made of lead and not rubber, as the saying goes. And you have to learn to be concise. Uh, those are my principal memories. Perhaps um, uh, as the discussion goes on, we can raise some other issues to discuss. So I will be happy to pass the baton along to the distinguished Mr. Eric at this point in time. Thank you, Harry. Um, I don't know whether we should um, <clears throat> maybe just pause for a minute. I'm sorry. Give thanks to all those who have made this possible. Um, you know, I see a lot of organizations struggling to maintain their cohesion and they're not doing things like this and it shows. So I, thanks to John and Jonathan and others who have made this possible. Uh, I was glad to be asked to, to do this. It's a, little, it's a little daunting. I've not seen, uh, I've only been to one reunion and have not seen um, in, any of you um, for a lot of years, I see my, my roommate Jack Hunt is here and I've not seen Jack for 55 years, a long, long time. Um, and I look, but I look forward to reminiscing about the, the paper and um, what we did. Just a second here. But then I ran into an obstacle. Um, I discovered that I have very few, if any, memories of my year as executive editor. I have a lot of memories of Williams, um, especially a series of futile road trips and playing cards at um, Brooks House, laughing a lot. Uh, but I don't have uh, memories of the record experience. And so I wonder, is, is, is this sort of a selective dementia settling in? You know, we're at that age where we start to think about that. And I never did, I could never answer why I didn't remember. But then I realized that what I took away from that experience was not a series of stories but a, a, a conviction and, a, and an ability. And that came clear to me as I was reflecting on more recent experience. So I wanna share with you that experience, the brief story, and then I wanna go back and take a look at my time as a, a co-executive editor. Um, In February, 2015, halfway through my 70th year, I pulled away from San Mateo, California, where my middle son lived and began a, a, um, what I intended to be an epic road trip. My destination was the Hudson Valley in New York where my wife and I lived, still live over 3,000 miles and 30 days away. I wanted to discover America. That's not an original thought with me. Steinbeck did it. William wow. East Heat Moon did it. A lot of people have done it. I wanted to drive not exactly the 10,000 mile route that Steinbeck drove. And I certainly had no intention of taking a dog with me but I wanted to see what was happening in my homeland. Um, and I wanted to drive the blue highways as William Lee's Heat Moon called them, those two lane roads that connect 
the cities and towns of America. I wanted to linger in the small places. I wanted to watch Burlington, Santa Fe railroad cars and engines roar by. I wanted to visit the Native American reservations, check out the fabled vistas of the American West, which I hadn't seen since I was 15. I wanted to eat barbecue every night. My doctor's <laughs> counsel to the contrary notwithstanding. I wanted to listen to the sounds of America on my car. And I wanted to see things up close. Hey, darling. What? You can uh, get supper ready. I'll just stop when you're ready. It did not turn out that way. Um, more often than not, the blue highways gave testimony to the heart to the hard times that were facing America's heartland. The small industrial towns that were dying, the highways that had not been maintained, the motels that had not been up upgraded. Um, when I sought out the native reservations, I found once great nations like the Navajo, Hopi and Apache barely surviving on the scrubland that the whites had deigned to give them. The one lively spot that I saw was Tahlequah, Oklahoma, um, terminus of the Trail of Tears, where civilized Cherokee had stopped their march and had built a strong culture while lazy whites kept looking for ways to steal their land. You have to read those stories to understand um, a bit more about who we are. When I turned on the car radio, I thought I'd hear a mixture of country music and you know some gospel music, maybe a little um, old rock and roll. What I heard was a disturbing drumbeat of talk shows spewing hatred, white power, and conspiracies, often on programs claiming to be Christian. I heard hatred of immigrants, hatred of blacks, hatred of liberals, hatred of the ones that they scornfully called elites. I heard the venom, I found this venom jarring. This wasn't what I was experiencing living in Manhattan and in an upstate New York. Why were these haters so terrified of skin color and languages unlike their own? When I stopped in towns, I found decay, rural poverty, and just a whole lot of angry people who would sort of shout at each other across the, the diner uh, uh, seating. Um, my road trip quickly turned dark. And I, I hadn't gone into it dark. I hadn't gone into it excited and feeling lighthearted. You know, this, this is one of the joys of retirement, that you can do things like this. Um, but I started wondering what, what had happened to my homeland when I was in New York enjoying myself. How had we become a nation of whiners and haters? Where was the durability and fortitude that had built this nation? Where was the optimism? <clears throat> Where was the civic spirit? It, it seemed that I was on a journey through things falling apart. And, and yet I, I stayed with it. I, I listened diligently to, the, to whatever was said. I, I, I looked for whatever came and I wrote about it each night in the diners of a failing culture. I wasn't writing Travels with Charlie as it turned out, but I was, I was trying to understand the world that I saw. I turned my daily jottings into a book uh, called Tulane Theology. But it was not a joyful end of life musing as Steinbeck's had been. It wasn't the fun, wasn't like the fun people were having elsewhere. It was just really, in many ways, uh, a, a grim time. Um, and I bought, you know, <laughs> it was my own 
my own doing, but there it was. Um, that adventure came immediately to mind when I was thinking about my experience with the record. Not that the record had been a grim adventure uh, in any sense, but for better or for worse, what I learned at Williams was how to see, how to see the world around me, how to see the reality, and not to feel badly about what I saw, but just to try to understand it. Um, I did not come out of Williams with a deep reservoir of factual information, or for that matter, sunny memories of good times. My four years at Williams were in, in many ways a challenge for me. Um, I was in some ways out of my element. But Williams taught me to live without benefit of tribe or fantasy or safe places to see even the darkness and to trust my seeing, not to be confused or repelled by it. I realized as I was reflecting on that, that my years on the Williams record were a critical component of learning to see. Yes, we had a narrow field of vision, a small college in a remote valley. We were not the Harvard Crimson, but we took it seriously. We tried to cover the news of a complex institution, the sporting endeavors of true amateurs and the diverse thoughts of 1200 students all bright, all capable, all striving, all trying very hard to do their best, all ambitious. We maintained our independence. Most school papers uh, eventually lose it, I think. Our large staff of reporters and opinion writers, cartoonists and photographers went out to see what there was to see. And our hardworking business staff enabled us to publish twice a, me twice a week. Uh, they did so, at least in part, by selling ads for muscle cars. Though I, I don't know that any of us would ever have been in the market for a muscle car. There they were, week after week, all the machines that perhaps now we wish we had had the, the, uh, the time or the courage to uh, undertake. I recently reread every issue of my year as executive editor, and it was an eye-opening experience. Much of what we covered was pedestrian, not earth shaking. But we saw, we reported, our writing was accurate as far as I could tell. And of course, it was always grammatical. We were more grammatical then than the New York Times is today. <laughs> Over sure. time, our coverage added up to something. That's what I realized. Here's what I saw in revisiting that year. More than anything else, this was a year, not the only year, but a year, when the outside world intruded on the happy Purple Valley. When we arrived, our valley was all a Twitter with talk of fraternities and residential houses. By 1966, 67, two, three, and four articles in almost every issue were about Vietnam and to a lesser extent about civil rights. We covered peace marches, lectures, trying to analyze the war and help us understand it, impassioned meetings, lamenting the war and facing the dread of the draft. We covered labor strife. I would remember going to, a, a, to help strike with Schenectady. We covered lectures in which students sought expertise in things they never had imagined they would want expertise in, like policy, Asian nationalism, and power politics. We documented our intellectual outrage over what politicians were doing. Nearly three quarters of the student body took a draft deferment test, and when you remember that, aimed at demonstrating our importance to something other than jungle warfare. <coughs> Between the lines, our reporting shows how students felt they felt helpless, facing a war effort that saw us, even us, even the best and the brightest, as a fungible commodity. 
As I read our issues, I saw the accelerating pace of change that was enveloping the college, enveloping us. The college was tearing down old facilities and building new facilities, especially in the sciences. They announced major enhancements in the curriculum. The first woman was granted tenure during our time there. Co-education was on the horizon. It was a time of change and more change. And I'd say that that has defined our generation. At the record, we took all of this seriously, even when the news seemed trivial, like the diehards at SIU demanding fraternity-like privileges. But learning to see meant glimpsing the pathos and the injustices in a virtually all white school with scant incidents of poverty. We weren't exactly clued into the pain done by others, but I think we became sympathetic bystanders and colleagues and allies. We did miss the boat at times. We acceded to official requests that we not report when students committed suicide as they did. We did not give any coverage. It's hard to imagine this now. We did not give any coverage to LGBT issues. Having learned something about, let's go come back forward now, having learned something about seeing and about sensing the changing world outside, why did I devote my life, my professional life, to two institutions that were bound and determined not to change, not to deal with reality, namely print journalism and the church. Why head into places where people were content to die? Well, first of all, thanks in part to the record, I saw the nation's need for serious journalism. For democracy to thrive, we needed information, tellers of truth, people who would stand up to the powerful. As we are seeing in our time, the first act of demagogues is always to kill the reporters and then to claim that the truth is whatever the powerful say it is. Second, again, thanks to the ethics of Williams, I saw that we needed a moral compass not more ideology, not more traditions, not more religious showmanship. We needed the liberal ideals of humaneness, integrity, individual self-determination, justice, and self-sacrifice. Third, while I saw soon enough that print journalism was dying, especially on the local level, and while I saw that many churches were losing members and retreating, I took the Williams Creed to heart. I believed that I could reach high and far. I could make a difference. I could be an optimist. I could give my best. I could stand up to leaders trying to hide from scrutiny. I could serve and help bring life to those who had stopped believing in themselves. Imagine then the sadness that I felt when driving across my homeland in 2015 and seeing the darkness shrouding our political life, trivializing our cultural life and corrupting our religious life. Imagine expecting a road trip with Charlie, as it were, but tasting instead the acid of hatred, corroding civility, fear destroying our lives, bullies riding roughshod, and the lowest elements claiming the moral high ground. So what did I do? Well, I did what I think Williams people generally do. I wrote about it. I knew that the, from the record and from teachers like Robert Gaudino that this wasn't a time for fantasy. When a society turns out the lights, wishing on stars was dancing with the devil. I wrote about it in a book. I wrote about it in provocative articles for newspapers. I started a weekly newsletter. I wrote several other books. I acted out what I had learned at Williams. And that's what I want to leave you with. I acted out what I had learned at Williams, that words have power. Well-chosen words have grace. 
And despite what our politicians are telling us, truth does matter. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you indeed. Thank you're you, muted. Tom. You're muted, Tom. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Uh, your eloquence is only exceeded by your understanding of real truth. And you've spoken to us uh, from the heart and with great wisdom. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Harry, as well. I was muted earlier, and I appreciate everything all you reflected upon. So now we have 10 or 15 minutes for your questions to them. And I think uh, as listeners, and uh, we have a lot of seeds have been planted. So please, there's not that many of you, raise your hands or use the yellow. Bob Conway, please. I, you, know, you know, John, I, I, it's Marty. I, I don't, can't figure out how to raise my hand. Can I make a quick comment? Oh, sure, go ahead. I, I thought it was striking to listen to all three of you guys is absolutely wonderful. And a theme arose uh, that um, this, this, this issue of learning to see at Williams, uh, I can relate to that. I feel uh, exactly the same feeling. And I wonder what the three of you think about what's happened to journalism, whether uh, modern journalism is still, uh, so important to us and it is the, the organ with which we see the world or whether you think it's been corrupted. I'm very interested in your view about that. Jonathan, <laughs> whoever's on area code 803 to mute, there's just been for the past hour. Who's area code 803 who hasn't muted with that's that? That's me, that's me. All right, thanks. Well, I, I, will, I will say um, just to kick it off, I think the New York Times single-handedly saved American democracy in their handling of the last five, six years. They have shown what good journalism is and we owe them a great debt. And we, um, I'd say the Washington Post, LA Times, Wall Street Journal um, are, are doing marvelous work. Most small local papers, um, if they're alive at all, are struggling to the extent that they don't dare do much that rocks any boats. Harry or Harry, Harry or Harry. Yeah. Well, now I would agree with Tom there. Um, we're fortunate in having some powerful institutions that have dealt with transition. I mean, one of the problems that journalism faces is that the whole business model has changed. Since daily newspapers were traditionally funded by retail advertising and want ads. Well, um, retail advertising has gone elsewhere <coughs> and want ads are exclusively online. So there are, well, I mean, papers with power and prestige like the Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal could set up a paywall and make it stick. I mean, the New York Times now has more than 2 million online subscribers, which is how it can continue to finance its operations on a rather grand scale, <laughs> at least by modern journalistic standards. Um, uh, but I also think the the big problem is not <laughs> necessarily that journalistic institutions um, um, have failed than that people are less demanding about where they get their news. You know, they think, well, if they get it in something at Mildred forwarded on Facebook. Well, gee, that must be a fact, mustn't it? <laughs> well, uh, no. <laughs> There's no editorial control, which is one of the things, you know, the reasons these big institutions are so important is that they do have editorial control. 
and they do their best to avoid putting something out unless they know it's accurate. And they're also wise enough to tell you that they know what they don't know. I mean, well, for example, a lot of the coverage of the war in Ukraine, you get these videos which look authentic and which in some ways can be verified. They have these, if it's taken on a cell phone, it often has identifying information about the time and the place. <clears throat> but the, the TV media often say, we have been unable to independently verify the accuracy of these facts. So that's a good practice. Also, I think, on well, some issues, as well, Tom mentioned that there wasn't anything about LGBT issues in the record. Um, uh, I would beg to differ slightly because you know, our, the end of that freshman year, the, the whole business of house selection was muddied by the fact that a few of the houses deliberately sought to discourage some of us from joining their houses. And this was all about homophobia. Let's be blunt. Everyone knows it, but no one used that word. No one expressed it in those terms. It was just described as um, bad behavior. <laughs> and the college did respond by, by seeking a different method of assigning people to houses. In my visits to the campus since then, I can say with good assurance that the college still has not figured out the best way <laughs> to assign incoming students to residential houses. This is a subject that's constantly being tinkered with. But at least there now is open discussion of LGBT issues and that. Um, uh, various groups of students on campus who discuss these issues in the open and get them out in public. But that le has less to do with the journalistic institutions and more to do with changes in society. Can I, can, this is Jim Lynn. Um, can I just ask a question? When um, I guess it was Tom who mentioned, you know, there would never be um, coverage of a suicide and so on. Who was making those kinds of decisions? I mean, if, these, if the paper was quote unquote independent, how did the college keep a framework around what was allowable? Uh, what I recall, um, it was that the administration asked us not to cover it. Mm -hmm. I suppose theoretically we had the we had the choice to agree or not to agree, um, but the request came from from them. Right. Well, also in my case, um, uh, it was it, it it was an issue that I sort of did not feel comfortable exploring because you know. There was a lot of um, uh, bad water among certain groups of students. Um, uh, and I didn't want to get involved in what appeared to be petty gossip. Um, uh, which it could degenerate into very quickly. And, you know, if you can't get anyone official to comment on it, it does no, sort of leaves you out there. Bob Conway, I, I ignore, I didn't mean to ignore you. Please go next, and then Ted McPherson. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, I was going to talk to you, Tom, for a minute, but but first, Harry, uh, the history of gay students at Williams has never been written, as far as I know, and it should be. Your comment about what happened in the spring of our freshman year in the houses, I remember that vividly, the stories circulating around. 
Well, I the remember time. them because they happened to me. But. I'm sure. I'm sure they did. And I, I apologize on everyone's behalf oh. for what happened. Uh, Tom, you, you've just demonstrated you're the latest example of why these class sessions have been so valuable. Not only did I learn a lot from you, but I learned who you were. I, I didn't know who you were in college, to my detriment. And I could say that about a lot of students, a lot of classmates. And that's been the beauty of these, these meetings, and I appreciate it greatly. And it's also what makes reunions beautiful. I, I didn't go to any reunions until the 40th. I avoided them like the plague. But boy, was I wrong. And I've been to everyone since, and I'm coming to the next one too. And I encourage all of you to come, if only for that reason, to discover in person the riches that all of us bring to each other. So thank you so much. It was very, very moving. And I'm so glad that I was here to hear it. Thank you. Go ahead, Ted. Ted, go ahead. Thank you, Bob. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I just offer a thought for everyone's consideration. Because of our life experience that started at Williams together, I think we all can take ownership for our own determination of tellers of truth. I, I would never default to advocacy journalism, social media, where I was seeking the truth just for curiosity or just to help make a decision or determine something important. So journalism has changed, lots of things have changed, but I think the need for healing on some of these issues is at the individual level, the community level, to determine tellers of truth. That's my thought. Thank you. Rick Ackerley. Oh, I just wanted to, uh, I just raised my hand. I wanted to say what Bob Conway said. Though, so I second every word out of his mouth. And, and, and yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Ron Bodenson. Uh, actually, there was an article written by a member of the class in 1970. It wasn't published for decades afterwards, but it was captured in uh, Fred Rudolph's Anthology of Williams about uh, what it was like to be a gay at Williams in 1970. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a very poignant article uh, not a happy one, but uh, there have been writings. I encourage you, and I don't have a copy of the article in front of me. It's downstairs, and I can't move fast enough to get it. But I'll send it to somebody, and we can circulate it. But it was certainly an eye-opening um, article. Those of us who weren't gay had no idea what hell those who were gay going through in silence during those years. As Dan Pinella, class of, I want to say 72, I think, but maybe yeah. 70. Good article, and Dan's been very effective. But golly, um, a couple well, of us who are gay on this call, things change pretty <laughs> rapidly after Williams College in the yeah. world. Yeah, well, I mean, also, Dan was an editor of the Rick. Yeah. And he came out in the paper before he came out to everyone else. I'll be there. And I remember having a conversation with him in which he explained that this made his social life very difficult <laughs> <laughs> because the people he hoped to attract thought that he was this you know, high powered um, uh, mover and shaker and that they were not really worthy of, you know simply having a mere you know, cocktail with him or a cup of coffee, which is another dimension of the problem. If you're going to, if you're going to come out and say it, um, 
<laughs> it's nice to have some from support around, which you know, right. I certainly did. I, sus- I suspect most of our classmates do too. I know that we're well, different groups on campus, but we're sort of coming to the end of our time, and I don't want to cut anyone off. I appreciate the endorsement for reunions and coming to them. Uh, my own experience has been rich and full and I'm ever impressed by all of you. I feel so lucky to uh, hear from you and know you better. So thank you. Um, I think we, with that, we will say farewell for this evening. Yeah, I again, look forward to seeing many of you and a few of you at least in June. We're, we're, a, we're a wonderful group. Thank you. Or on May 19th, or next uh, Zoom. Oh, that's right. We, oh, excuse me. We have Tom Parker. Thank you, Ron. You're much smarter and more. <laughs> Oops. I'm off again. On March the 19th, on, uh, at 7 p.m., we have uh, Tom Parker, who was uh, the director of admissions at Williams or at, at Amherst for many, many years, and hopefully will give us some perspectives on what the college admission process is like today, uh, which is a very timely topic, especially as Williams has just, as I think you all know, gone uh, loan free. Maud is uh, giving a talk about that, uh, I think next week that we can all listen in on and perhaps learn more. But thank you all. You're a a rich and interesting group that I feel so lucky to know. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Harry. Harry, thank you. 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 Thank you.